The unity of God's people is really important to Jesus. And you hear him talk about it often during his earthly ministry. And the Gospel of John, for instance, in chapter 17, that's the place where Jesus offers his, his high priestly prayer. Jesus prays for his disciples then, and then all disciples that would come after him or after them, that the disciples would be one as Jesus, the Son, and the Father are one. What a remarkable prayer. There's, there's no greater unity in existence than the unity in the Godhead between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And God desires us as his people. Jesus prayed for us as his people that we would be moving toward that kind of supernatural unity in John 17. And then in John 13, earlier in John 13, Jesus says this. He's given us a new commandment. He says, I give you this new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. Your love is to be the thing that binds you together. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So in the earthly ministry of Jesus, he is teaching us that the way we love one another matters deeply to the the mission of the gospel, to the work of the gospel. Is it evidence for us? And how God is growing us together as a community of faith. And it's a testimony to the world of the power of Christ's gospel and his unique worth as our Lord. That's why it's really such a shame to see the amount of disunity that has plagued the church throughout her history. Now it is true that some of the divides that have taken place over the the two plus thousand years of the Christian church's existence were necessary because it was a defense of our core doctrines, things like justification by faith and the priesthood of the believer. Those those divides were difficult but necessary. Sometimes we've divided over sin. There's a major denomination in America right now having a discussion over the place of sin in their, their fellowship and they are dividing over that right now. So sometimes there are necessary hard divides. But the reality is the majority of the times that we have divided as the people of God, it's been over silly things like the temperature of the worship center, the color of the carpet, the paint on the walls, the order of worship, among some other things. I was reading an article earlier this week from Tom Rainer, and he he had put out kind of a survey on what was formerly known Twitter, asking people to tell him about some of the, the interesting ways that churches had gotten in arguments some of the interesting reasons that churches had experienced division. I thought I would read some of you, uh, some of them for you this morning. The first he mentions was there was an argument at one church over the appropriate length of the worship pastor's beard because they believed there was biblical evidence that it should not be longer than 1.5 inches. There was a fight over how to use some land at one church, whether to put a children's playground on it or to use it as a cemetery. A church argued over whether or not a clock should be put and remain in the worship center. There was a 45-minute heated argument at one church over what type of filing cabinet they should purchase for the church office, black or brown, two, three, four drawers. There was one church that broke out in a fight over which picture of Jesus to hang up in their worship center. There was one church that divided or experienced a divide because someone chose to use crayon grape juice in the Lord's Supper instead of the pure grape juice. There was an argument at one church over what type of green beans should be served at a potluck. There was one church that got into an argument over whether or not deviled eggs were appropriate to serve at a church picnic. Two different churches reported fights over the type of coffee that was being used. One group of people got mad because they had moved to a stronger Starbucks brand instead of Folgers. Another other group moved away because the, the coffee had gotten too weak. Now, we laugh at those examples because they are and seem a little ridiculous. But the reality is those are true accounts True accounts of God's people falling short of the prayer that Jesus prayed for them. And how every argument, every split must grieve the heart of God regardless of the severity of the issue. Now it is true that the Lord can redeem anything and has 
redeemed, the moments of failure that we have evidenced as the people of God. But we must also strive, people at Bayleaf Baptist Church, to be the kind of people that God doesn't have to overcome, whose testimony he doesn't have to overcome in order to advance the gospel. And so this morning, as we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I want to remind us of the importance of Christian unity and to call us, as Paul does in another book he wrote, the book of Ephesians, to be zealous for it, to fight for Christian unity because we realize the importance of our unity for the sake of the gospel, this mission that God has entrusted to us. Here's our main point this morning. Those who are truly in Christ will promote unity among God's people for the sake of Christ. Those who are truly in Christ will promote unity among God's people for the sake of Christ. Let's hear the appeal from Paul to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 3. Here's what God's word says. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. And even now, you're not yet ready, for you're still of the flesh. For, for while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What, is it, what then is Apollos? What's Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but it was God that gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. We are fellow workers for God. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a, a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. Someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid in Christ Jesus. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it. Because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, the foundation of Christ, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, although he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you, church, are God's temple? And that God's spirit dwells within you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy. And you, church, are that temple. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. It is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. They are futile. So let no one boast in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ's and Christ is God's. We're returning here in chapter 3 to a subject that Paul began addressing in chapter 1, verses 10 through 17, the issue of division, disunity in the church. It's important to note, though, that the words of Paul in between those sections, in the interval between 17 of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 3, are not disconnected, but rather they are, they are foundational to how Paul wants to address the division within the church. Paul desires to help the church see the reason for their disunity, the way that, God is, uh, the, way that the enemy is using it to threaten their witness, but also to help them remember the cure for their disunity, the the wisdom of God that has been revealed in Christ. So let's see how Paul sets forth this appeal to the Corinthian church and why it may be an important message for us today as well. Paul begins his appeal by addressing the symptom of the church's disunity. Now I want to use the language here of symptom and disease because I believe it's important. It's a, it's a good spiritual muscle for us as a people to develop the discernment as God's people of the root of our issues. It's important to address the surface level, 
the symptom of what's taking place, but we also got to get to the root of our sin so that we know exactly where we need God's help, his spirit to work so that we can walk forward in faithfulness. Uh, two years ago, I had a, a sinus infection and I had to take an antibiotic. An antibiotic I have taken numerous times in my life. But something interesting happened this last time I took the antibiotic. A rash came out on the entirety of my body. I mean, just like that. A rash was everywhere and it was itchy and I had to deal with the rash. And so I put cream on, I took Benadryl, all those things that you do whenever you have an allergic reaction to deal with the symptom. But that wasn't the cause, right? It was an effect. What would have happened if I had taken that same antibiotic again? That same rash would have popped right back up, right? So you got to deal with the symptom, but you also got to know the disease. You got to know the cause. And both are important here for Paul. He begins by telling them, hey, you need to look and see that something's wrong. There's a symptom, a sinful symptom that is in your church that needs to be addressed. And that symptom is a divide over leadership. Now, I won't belabor this point because we've talked about it several times in the course of our study in Corinthians, even to this point. But just as a way of reminder, the church in Corinth was being influenced by its culture and the way that they were looking at their leaders. They were, they were choosing sides, lining up behind different pastors and preachers and trying to garner support of people to join them, saying that their pastor, their preacher was better. Remember, Corinth had professional speakers at this time. There wasn't Netflix or cable or anything like that. So what you did at the time was you went to go listen to people talk and talk about what they talked about. And in Corinth, there were all these sophists wisdom sayers that patrons, really rich people, would bring in and have them as a form of entertainment. And it became a, a source of pride as, you know, sophists, the larger the crowds they grew, the more money they got, they were pleased with that. The patrons were really excited that the people that they brought in and put their money behind were, were bringing these large crowds and it was giving them a lot of favor in the community. And what was happening in the culture began to infiltrate into the church. That same kind of patronage, that same kind of, of pitting one another against each other began to infiltrate the church. The sin of preference grew and it became more than preference, Paul says in verse 3. It became jealousy. It became strife. These, these rivalries had infiltrated the church to where brothers and sisters in Christ no longer saw each other as family, but as competition, and perhaps even enemies. And so Paul says to them, guys, this divide is foolish. It is foolishness what's taking place for a number of reasons. Let me just draw your attention to two. First of all, you're completely missing the gift, the point of godly leadership. Because one of the purposes of godly leadership, as articulated by scripture, is to promote unity. Paul Challenging Titus as he sends him to Crete in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, he says to him, Hey, go set things in order. There's disorder, there's chaos, there's division. You go set things in order. You, you help bring unity to the situation at that church. God's, God has raised up godly leaders to help lead the people of God under the authority of God to exalt Jesus. Not the leaders themselves. But again, the Corinthian church had allowed the culture to define their view and expectation of leadership rather than the Bible. And we're going to talk more about that next week as we move into 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And then the second reason Paul calls this disunity, this division, foolish, is because not only are they missing the point and the gift of leadership, godly leadership, they're perhaps more importantly missing the point of the gospel. Because, friends... One of the central messages of the gospel is supernatural, miraculous reconciliation. First with God in Christ, because we need to be reconciled to God in Christ. Our sin has separated us from a holy and righteous God, but also with one another. Because that sin had an effect 
A ripple effect, separation from God, but also from other human beings, enmity between us and God and with each other. But the gospel is working. Christ is working in us to overcome both. And we as the people of God are meant to exhibit the power of the gospel at work within us. But that's just a symptom. You need to recognize this is a, is a sin issue, but there's also something deeper going on. And so Paul moves deeper to diagnose the true cause of their disunity. You see, last week, Paul ended our text at the end of chapter two by saying that truly spiritual people, truly spiritual people, people who are in Christ are to have the mind of Christ. That if we're in Christ, we begin to think and see and, and live through a, a gospel lens. We are to have the mind of Christ. But he begins chapter three with a strong word of rebuke to the Corinthian church. He says, brothers, I couldn't address you as spiritual people. You're supposed to have the mind of Christ, but I can't address you as spiritual people. I can't act with the assumption that you have the mind of Christ because of the way that you are acting toward one another. You're not receiving the message that I offer as wisdom, but rather milk. You're saying the gospel is milk and you're looking to other places to find meat, even though there's no more meaty message if you have the mind of Christ than the gospel of Jesus Christ. What Paul is suggesting here is that the church in Corinth is full of so-called carnal Christians. Carnal Christians, that's the disease. Have you heard this term? Yeah. Carnal Christians. It describes someone who is in Christ, but for whatever, whatever reason, there's an aspect of their life in which they are not following Christ, not acting like Christ. And this is a whole new category of apostolic address for Paul. We've seen him, previous to chapter 3, distinguish between wise and foolish. There's, there's, there are wise people and foolish people. He's distinguished between spiritual people and natural people. It's kind of the same category because wisdom is attached to the spirit. But now Paul is dealing with the categories of spirit and flesh. And here's why this is important. This is a category within Christianity. Look, look at, begin, at the beginning of our chapter, verse one. He, he talks to them as if they are brothers. He says, brothers. He's addressing them as if they are in Christ. And yet, even though they are in Christ, they are not operating with the mind of Christ in the particular area of the way that they are looking at leaders. They're acting in a merely human way, and Paul wants to remind them that they know better. They should know better than this. Brothers, I can't address you as spiritual people. I fed you with milk, not solid food. You weren't ready for it. That's what you're accusing me of anyway. And now, even now, you're not ready for you're still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh, behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? You're not letting God's word and the mind of Christ Guide the way that you view the work of your pastors and leaders. And because of that, you're acting in a merely human way. And as a result, jealousy, strife are, are bubbling up. And those aren't fruits of the Spirit. Those aren't fruits of the Spirit. And disunity is not a testimony to the power of God. You need to repent and grab hold of the cure for the disease that is infiltrating, infecting your church. And the cure, no surprise here, is Christ. Amen. Christ crucified. Hear me, church. Christ is always, always, always. Look to your neighbor and say always. Christ is always the hero of God's story. Always. Jesus is the hero of the Bible. He is the one who must always receive the glory. He is the one that we boast in. He's the one that we should seek to follow because he is the one who builds his church. Paul reminds the church in Corinth of everyone's appropriate roles to help them get their eyes on Christ. The foundation of the church is Jesus. Verse 11, 
No one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Verse 23, you are Jesus's, not Paul's, not Apollos, not Cephas's. You are Jesus's, you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. He is the foundation, but here, church, hear what God is doing in Christ. He is building you into something glorious, and I don't want anything to threaten. I don't want anything to threaten not even a godly gift to threaten what God is building you into. He is building you, verses 16 and 17, into a temple in which the Spirit of God dwells. Think about this. In this gathering, in the unity of of this people, God has promised a unique manifestation of himself that you cannot receive or encounter anywhere else. I know you know this. But when you come into this room and we gather around God's word, don't you know that God meets us here in a unique way? He is forming us, building us into the meeting place. This this place is a meeting place around God's word between us and God. And we become a shining light and testimony to the world of the glory of God. And because of this presence, because of the promise that God is attached to the gathering of his people, there is an importance in our unity. God uses the ministry of the word and the power of the spirit to build us up together into Christ, together into his image, to help us mature and walk worthy together of the name of Jesus that we bear. Apollos, Paul, Cephas, they're servants. They serve Jesus. Yes, the Lord in his goodness allowed Paul to come and minister at Corinth. The Lord in his goodness allowed Apollos to come and minister to to Corinth. But verses five through nine, what is Apollos? What is Paul? I planted, Apollos watered, but we didn't bring about the growth. We did not bring about your salvation. We did not bring about your spiritual maturity. God did that in Christ. It was because of God he gets the glory. So church, Paul says, I don't want your worship. Apollos does not want your worship. We don't want you to divide over us. If we did, we would be in judgment and our work would be consumed by fire at the judgment of God, verses 13 to 15. No, we want to be a part of a work that will last for eternity and glorify God, building up on the foundation of Christ. So you boast in him, not man, not me, not him, not Cephas. You boast in Jesus. Reject, reject the wisdom of this world and embrace the wisdom of Christ. That's the only way to move from carnality to faithfulness. So if you can, repent. Disunity has no place among the people of God. Disunity has no place among the people of God because the gospel is a message of reconciliation. Remember what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5. Be reconciled to God in Christ who for our sake took upon himself our sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We evidence together our reconciliation to God by the way that we are reconciled to each other, by the way that that he is making us into his temple, a lighthouse of salvation to a divided world. Now let's spend some time getting practical. How does what Paul writes here about unity How should it affect us? What is what is the Holy Spirit through these inspired words calling us to do? Let me just offer a few responses for us this morning to consider from Paul's words, his address to the Corinthian church, and by God's will to us today. First, Bailey Baptist Church, let's fight for the unity of our church. Let's be zealous for the unity of our church. Is it possible for division to creep into God's church today? Yes. Is it possible for us to to step into a place where we are divided and lead to division? Yes. Now, sometimes, as I said earlier, division is necessary, although hard. 
We must protect Christ and the gospel. We must protect our core doctrines. We must guard against the place of sin amongst us. But the reality is the majority of time we move toward division and disunity, it's over small, tertiary, secondary things. And I think it's possible for us to experience what's happening directly here in 1 Corinthians 3. I think it's possible to divide over pastors and preachers. I've certainly seen this, seen this happen, kind of a cult of personality creeping up in the church. When churches have the, the benefit of, and blessing of having multiple pastors on their church and, and many of them can preach God's word. I've seen people, when they recognize who's preaching on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night, get up and leave because they don't like that person preaching. Can I just ask a question? Is, is the messenger more important than the message? No. Listen, if, if whoever's standing behind this pulpit, any, any place of teaching in our church, if they, are, if they are opening God's word and exalting Jesus, don't we believe there's a blessing in us for that? Regardless, regardless of the messenger, because of the message, let's, let's guard again. And, and listen, it's worse today also because of, of the many preachers we get to hear outside of the church. And listen, I, I, I recognize and want to give thanks to God for the gift of technology allowing us to hear faithful preachers of God's word from the past 100, 200 years to read their messages. But be careful that we don't begin comparing those who are historically wonderful, great communicators with the, the pastors God has blessed our individual local churches with. Because then you can begin bringing about comparisons that are not gonna bring about spiritual maturity or good. Our focus is always Jesus, Always Jesus. Listen, I know I'm not Pastor Ron. I know that I'm not Pastor Marty. But what I would know that they would all say is that at the end of the day, our commitment is to point people to Jesus. It's not a comparison between the pastors who have been here previously. Our goal always is to exalt Christ. And as long as that is the goal, gathering around the word, making much of Jesus, there will be good things happening here that we should support and applaud. So that's possible to encounter the same kind of danger, the exact same kind of danger, this, this preference over preachers that happened in 1 Corinthians 3. But what I think in terms of preference is actually more applicable today that will actually cause disunity is not a cult of personality, but rather a cult of worship style. And so can you turn to your neighbor and say, it's gonna be okay? I promise you it is, but listen, this is a topic we must talk about. We must. Because I have seen churches devastated over this particular topic. Now, I want to be careful for obvious reasons. I know the Lord has used various songs and various styles of music to minister to us as a means of grace. And I want to give thanks to the Lord for that. I also want to say I think there is an appropriate place for us to have conversations around what kind of music best serves the church. But I also think that when it comes to preference regarding worship, these days, a lot of people are pouring concrete around preference and making enemies of people who simply enjoy different styles of songs. I'm getting, not, not words, not language, but arrangement. We gotta be careful here, friends, that we don't let a, a healthy, important discussion around a wonderful gift from God to lead us to disunity. Our singing should unify us in the worship of God, and yet the enemy has often used it to divide. I had a conversation with a brother one time who was talking about his specific preference for a style of worship, and he said to me, I don't believe those other people are actually honoring the Lord with their worship. I said, brother, you better be careful about those kind of words. Because that's building up that pride that may lead you to a place of downfall. And I encourage them to think differently, kind of like C.S. Lewis did. There's a wonderful quote from C.S. Lewis in, a, in an article that he wrote years ago. I'm not sure if it was in a, new, a newspaper or some other publication, but he was answering a question that was written to him. Here's the question. Is attendance at a place of worship or membership with a Christian community necessary to a Christian way of life. And C.S. Lewis admitted in his early years, he didn't think gathering with God's people was necessary. He thought he could commune with God on his own. But as he read scripture, 
he began to see that there were, there were aspects of our faith, aspects of the Christian faith that could not be enjoyed in isolation, that he needed the people of God. But there, was all, there were also some, some difficulties for him as he began to think about joining in a community of faith. And he's, here's what he talked about, the, the difficulty of music for him. He said, I went to this church and I disliked their music very much. <laughs> I disliked their hymns, he said which I considered, those hymns in particular, I considered them to be fifth-rate poems set to sixth-rate music. What a review, right? <laughs> Thankfully, he didn't publish the name of the church. But as I went on, I saw the great merit of it. Isn't that interesting? I saw the great merit of these songs. I came up against different people of quite different outlooks and different education, and then gradually my conceit or my pride just began feeling, uh, peeling off. I realized that these hymns, which were, he, he puts this in quotation or, or which in parentheses, which were just sixth rate music, <laughs> were nevertheless being sung with devotion and benefit by an old saint in elastic side boots in the opposite pew. And then you realize I'm not fit to clean those boots. And it gets you out of your solitude. It gets you out of your conceit. And friends, that is the right posture regardless of whether or not you think a certain song is preferable to you, here's the benefit of corporate worship. To look around and to see your brother and sister singing those words of faith with sincerity, knowing what they've walked through, knowing what they've gone through, knowing the difficulties of their life. And, and here they say, here they sing, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. And that's the encouragement as we point each other together in Christ, it's meant to unify us, not divide us. Bailey Baptist Church, do not let the enemy get a foothold in this body. Please. Here's the point. When we divide over relatively small things, what does that say about our gospel? The gospel of Christ. What does that say about God's presence and work among us? Do we believe the power of the gospel can hold us together beyond our preferences? Yes. And we want to be a gospel people here at Bailey. Let's show our unity in the midst of diversity. Let's show our unity in spite of differing, differing preferences, 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 there, whatever that word is. <laughs> Opinions, preferences, there it is. Our willingness, let's show our willingness to sacrifice for the good of our brothers and sisters because we are willing to sacrifice for the, the sake of Christ. Let's be zealous for unity, a unity that is ours in Jesus because God sent Jesus to unite all things in him. Ephesians 1. Let's fight for unity among God's people. Secondly, let's guard against car carnal Christianity. The way disunity will get into our body is through carnal Christianity. Places in our life where we have not fully surrendered control to Lord King Jesus. So let's be very clear what we're talking about here because I don't want there to be any confusion as we talk about what it means to be a carnal Christian, okay? When we use that term, I want to give some parameters here. We're not saying that there are classes of Christians. We're not saying that you can lose your salvation. We're also not saying that it's possible for someone to be saved and evidence no sign of transformation or change. Because repentance and the work of the Holy Spirit must always, always show up. But we have to recognize there are places in our life that have not yet matured into full Christ-likeness. Listen, all of us know that, all, that the people in this room are at different places on their journey of faith. Christian maturity is different among all of us. And that doesn't always reflect natural maturity, right? There are different places of Christian maturity. And there, my guess is, in all of us, there are places that need to mature more and more into the image of Christ. And the reality is, friends, if we're not always before the mirror of God's word, praying in the spirit, God, show me those places that do not look like Jesus so that I can grow more like Christ, then there will be a foothold of the enemy to begin to influence our thinking away from the mind of Christ toward the, the foolishness of the wisdom of this world. So friends, let's be on guard. Let's be on guard so that jealousy and strife don't have a place in the church. Let's ask God to help us grow in Christ. And I want to take a little bit step further here in our third application. Let's consider the danger of unrepentant sin. 
Again, it is possible for believers. Again, Paul addresses the, the, the church in Corinth. He says they have the Spirit, they are brothers, and yet they're not acting like it. It's possible for seasons or times for us to not walk in fullness in the image of Jesus. But hear me, at some point, repentance must come. Now, I in no way want to cause unnecessary fear over the, the state of your salvation. But I do want to give an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to work. So let me just ask you this morning, is there persistent, unrepentant sin in your life? Because if there is, we may be talking about different categories altogether this morning. Not spirit versus flesh, but spiritual versus natural. If you can live your life without feeling the conviction of sin and continuing in that sin and masking that sin with religious behavior, that should be a huge check engine light for you that you need to bring before the Lord. Now, it's entirely possible you're walking as a carnal Christian. But it's also possible if there's no desire or are moved toward repentance that you may have not had a saving experience with Jesus Christ. And what we would love to do as pastors here at your church is to help you navigate that. If there's any confusion or concern, come talk to us. Let us pray with you because we want everybody in this room to be united to God in Christ. So consider the danger of unrepentant sin. And let us help you navigate that by leading you hopefully in God's word to repentance of the sin or repentance unto salvation. And then finally, church, can we be thankful? Thankful to, to God for the work he is doing in Christ. Thankful to God for the way he is building his church. Would you just listen to this? Do you know, church family, do you know Bailey Baptist Church that you are God's temple? Do you know that? And that God, listen, this, this building, as beautiful as it is, is not God's temple. You, we, are God's temple. God's spirit dwells in us because of the work of Christ. And God will protect his church. What a wonderful thing. I think about and consider. And listen, I want us to give thanks. Can we just give thanks for the, the godly leaders and the godly pastors, the godly, the people that men and women that God has placed in our lives to help us mature and grow in Christ? Let's, let's give thanks to them. Let's also remember that none of them are Jesus. Someone once told me that every pastorate, every pastorate is a temporary pastorate. Every pastorate, the temporary past, pastorate. We're all itinerants. We're all moving on because unless Jesus returns one day, I won't be here any longer. And someone else will step into this pulpit and prayerfully, hopefully, preach and proclaim God's word until the day that Jesus returns. We're all interim pastors. Let's not get our hopes, our, our, our lives tied up to any individual because they're not the ones who saved us. They're not the ones who can mature us. That is Christ's work. Amen. And all of us who are called into godly leadership, let's remember our ultimate aim is to point people to Christ because we boast only in him. Amen? Amen. Wherever you are, you are, would you bow your heads? Asking God to help you know how to respond this morning. Again, if you're unsure about your place before Jesus, if you're unsure about your salvation, we would love the opportunity to pray with you and talk to you this morning. Has there ever been a time in your life when you have confessed with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead to be saved? If not, we would love for today, today to be the day of your salvation. Come talk with us. Let's pray with you. Maybe there's a time in your life where you walked an aisle or you prayed a prayer, but there's been no evidence or of spiritual transformation in your life. And now you're living in persistent sin, unconfessed sin, and you don't even feel the sting or conviction of the Holy Spirit over it anymore. And you're concerned and you're wondering what that means for your spiritual well-being. Let us come, let us talk to you. Let us give you counsel. 
and pray with you. We want you to know where you stand with God and you can in Christ. And then for those of us who are in Jesus, how are we doing? Do we recognize and give thanks to the fact that God has said we are his holy temple and that his spirit is present here? And are we working to guard this union, this body, by being zealous for unity and guarding against those places in our life where the enemy can get a foothold, using preference to lead to jealousy and strife. Father, would you help us be a unified people? Would you help us love one another in such a way that we draw people to you, in such a way that we show Christ to be the hero of our story and your story. And we pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You stand and respond as the Lord leads. Thank you for joining us this week at Bayleaf. For more information about Bayleaf Baptist Church, visit our website at bayleaf.org.